Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Wilson. I'm the director of the Irving Institute for Energy Society here at Dartmouth. This term, we've been focusing on building a sustainable, resilient future, perspectives on building and energy. And one of our rationales for doing this was we are moving into our new building, hopefully in January, and we wanted to introduce you to our new home. We have a program today that involves the architects who can talk a lot about the energy and design challenges, as well as two student teams who are working with us to help figure out how we can animate the building and make it a vital place for us on campus. And so our new building, um, we wanted to introduce you to our new home. We're at the end of Tuck Mall and we'll be welcoming people into the site, we hope in January. Um, just to give you some context of where we are here in 2016, the um, Dartmouth announced the creation of the Institute for Energy and Society. And the Anne Society charge, which was what I was really drawn for, the idea of thinking about energy, but really within the context of all of the problems facing society. And so I joined in 2017 and work on the Institute had already begun, but we've been really working with the current set of architects to build the building um, over the last couple of years. And in 2019, construction finally began. And so the building itself, we've been starting to do tours now and you'll be hearing more about these different sites, but our job is really to think about how we can animate the space, how we can make it a vital place on campus and how we can make it a place that brings us all together to engage with the challenges of energy and society. Um, we'll have labs, we have classrooms, we have offices and meeting rooms. And the pieces that I have really appreciated are the ability to bring us all together. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Stephen Doig and the architects from Goody Clancy um, to talk a little bit more about the building and, and the site. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And Stephen, thank you very much for your engagement in the building and really making sure it meets the energy efficiency targets. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, well, why don't we get started? Uh, maybe Elaine, uh, I'm, work, well, I'm here, I'm Stephen Doig, I work at the Urban Institute, and I've been here since uh, January of 2019. And that's in fact when I met uh, Arjun and Elaine, who are both with Goody Clancy, the architects. And we've actually been working together now for the better part of three years. Uh, in the last couple of years, it's really been focused on the construction. Uh, when I joined the team, we were still in the design phase and people were really sizing up, how could we make this a, a super beautiful building, a super functional building? and one that was also uh, super efficient. And that's what we're gonna talk to you about over the next 15 minutes or so. So perhaps Elaine, we could just start with the first slide and you and Arjun can talk to you know, the site that we're in and some of the complexity is associated with uh, putting it in, in what was an existing area already with buildings. Um, hi, uh, I'm Arjun. Um, and um, so I'll start with the site. As you all know, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, it's right at the very end of the Tuck Mall. So we we thought that what a wonderful location, Baker Library at the other end. So so the building had to be this anchor that kind of captures that access, and it was really really important uh, for the building to do that. It also has uh, the tear of School of Business on one side and coming. So it had to be. Uh, this collaborator that works and uh, both on the inside and the outside and it was it was definitely not an easy site really really complex site uh, where as you all know that it the, the, there used to be a plaza here with multiple steps right in front of Murdo so a lot of great change a lot of topography a um, lot of multiple levels so our building actually sits on top of that plaza um, so we had to make we had to kind of make that all work and one other thing that you will see is that making that connection of them as you're coming from Baker Library, a pedestrian connection to the West End was really, really important. And we were able to do that um, right between this alley that we created um, between Cummings and our building. Great. Elaine, maybe um, you could say a little bit about, for Arjun about the, um, just the complexity and who we need to draw together. This wasn't a team of two or five, it was many different groups. Yes, so uh, go ahead, Elaine. Sorry, my um, unmute button was being uh, 
not behaving. So uh, this just lists many of the project stakeholders who have been, you know, involved in this project, as Elizabeth was describing, you know, for several years now. Um, and so, you know, the three of us are speaking to you from, you know, the positions of the architect and the institute user group, but there were many entities who were involved in the design, who many of whom, you know, were very much invested, just like we are, um, in delivering a very energy efficient building. Um, so, and the way that many of these stakeholders were involved, you know, went way, started way before construction um, to this sort of initial visioning of what the institute and the program could be, um, to what the you know performance goals for the building itself should be to support that vision, um, what specific priorities and strategies should be incorporated in the design um, to fulfill those goals, um, and sort of all the way through into these very specific components. Um, that form these larger strategies and systems to deliver, you know, a very energy efficient and comfortable project. Um, and, and I mean, oh, go I ahead. Jump in. Yeah, yeah. No, we should try to keep this as conversational as possible. I mean, a couple of just things for the audience is those goals there are impressive. They may not, they don't, I'll give you some context. The, this EUI, which is really the energy utilization index or energy intensity of the building, we were trying to get below 20. The campus average is 130. So this is an 85% reduction. And if we compare it to just similar buildings that are sort of office buildings and classrooms, it's roughly a 70 to 75% reduction. So it's an enormous step in the right direction. And the idea of also making it incredibly uh, comfortable, and I think people are gonna find this, it's gonna probably be the most comfortable building on campus. Most of the needs during the day are met by daylight that comes into the building in various ways. And the other thing that this, this chart sort of doesn't really tell you is that this all seems very logical and linear. And all we start at the left and we get over to the right and then we build the building. But as Elaine is about to point out, it's actually anything but that kind of a linear process. Yes. So it, this is you know, exactly the same information, but the integrative design process that we were all participating in, every one of these pieces is interconnected. And you know, each of these components does not simply serve one strategy or one goal, but they're all interrelated and in many cases dependent on each other. So it just took an enormous amount of coordination between all the entities that we discussed previously, you know, just to make sure that all these components work together so that all of these systems could continue to function and optimize, um, you know, and deliver this optimized building. So, and feel free to continue um, hopping in. So, but I think, um, Stephen kind of gave the context for this goal. Um, you know, hitting an EUI below 20 is, you know, quite challenging, particularly in climate zone six, um, where you're located. Uh, and the, this chart just shows how various and performance measures in the building led to different numerical energy savings. So the base case here is around 57, which is about three times um, the consumption that we ended up at. Um, and so this is just showing, you know, the relative impact of triple glazing um, and the overall improved envelope, various HVAC reductions, um, and then various advanced measures, um, which is what we're going to focus on um, in the back half of our presentation here. Um, and this is just showing, you know, those additional measures that would get us down further to 18. Um, do you want to jump in here, Arjun? Um, yeah, so, so, so all of that came together in something like this. And uh, we can actually see the building uh, on site now. So that central glass volume that kind of became that important anchor element you now is connected directly 
uh, on access with Baker Library, but more importantly, this idea of expressing that performance, like all these, the building is really high performance, so how do you express it? So one of the most important features uh, that we are all very proud of is the natural ventilation. Like sometimes you're in a room, you really want to open the windows and you can actually do that here in this building. And so the natural ventilation part, uh, natural ventilation is, is part, the glass volume is the overall, that design, gla design glass volume is part of the natural ventilation system. Um, and so we wanted to express that and there are going to be pieces of glass that are going to open and close. There are these window shades that come up and down depending on uh, uh, where the sun is. There's a small little weather station right up on top there at the roof that tells the building uh, what the weather immediately outside is. So it, it's, it's going to be this really wonderful feature, um, and we are, hope, we are hoping that um, it will make the users uh, extremely comfortable on the inside. Um, and on the inside, we, as Elizabeth mentioned, we wanted this to be a really collaborative space. So we are called the, the atrium space, which you see here in this image, we call it the living room. And it's just not living room for the building, but it's for living room for the entire West End. And um, there are these wonderful tables and chairs and benches, uh, sp spaces for performance. Uh, and Elizabeth, I, I remember you saying that somebody could actually play cello, uh, you know, right right in front of Felberg Library, and you could be sitting there and seeing that performance. And it could be this wonderful space, and it is going to be that space. And then, of course, the institute itself, which hap which is on the first and the uh, the second and the third floor that you see, um, and you'll be able to see all the wonderful activity and work that's going on uh, on there. And Arjun, can I just jump in for a second? Please do. Although that was a, this is an artist rendition. I've been in there many, many times, actually in cloudy weather or some of the foggy days we had last week, and with essentially no artificial lights on whatsoever, the room, the built building is full of light, and so it's actually come to fruition that the way the skylights were oriented and the way the building was built and the use of glass, that light is penetrating into many, many parts of the building. I think roughly 90% of the building square footage gets uh, some amount of natural light. And that makes a huge difference just in the way it, you feel inside and the actually ability to not have to turn lights on and therefore lower energy. Sorry about that. Well, that's on. Yeah, so the just want to add this, that, that the skylight that you see there and even the natural ventilation vents that you see here were all analyzed and sized accordingly so that you get that right amount of light and the right amount of air in the space. So that was, again, all part of expressing and making it very comfortable. Next, please. And we kind of went from the very large scale vision to, you know, you would, you know, to somebody sitting in an office and what does that do? So you can open the windows, a lot of daylight coming in, there is fan there for air movement, there is radiant ceilings there. So the idea here is that you are extremely comfortable um, uh, in the space and you have some kind of a control uh, to control, you know, the immediate kind of uh, the immediate surroundings of how you feel in that space by by opening up the windows or starting up a fan. And then if we move back to sort of this whole building view, um, you know, you were just looking at a rendering. Uh, I'm not sure if people can see my cursor or not, but you were just looking at a rendering, you know, facing back towards this main east bar here um, from this zone down close to Murdo. And um, this shows the sort of whole building design approach to maximize the ability to be using natural ventilation and therefore minimizing the need for mechanical cooling. So I think this is probably a good image to tie together some of the elements that we were already talking about. Um, so here, the double skin um, serves as the cavity for the natural ventilation exhaust through these two main rooms in the Institute space. So the air flows out um, through some operable, operable components above the ceiling, up through here, through some control dampers, 
into this fan room where we have these three enormous um, smoke um, evacuation fans that run at a very low speed um, when needed to help um, drive the natural ventilation. Um, and then out through these louvers, um, which we may also have some photos of. And then those vents um, that Arjun and Stephen were just describing, um, covered in the wood slats on this facade, show where we have the air transfer from the floor plate of the upper levels into the main atrium. And again, it goes up through um, this cavity here um, and into the fan room and out, um, you know, using um, the stack effect um, to help, help drive this um, natural airflow. So, um, oh yeah, and then of course, you can also see in this image a little bit more clearly the geometry of the skylights that we were looking at. Um, and you know, we don't have too many minutes left. This is a sort of an early sketch of this natural ventilation scheme. Um, And so I think if it's okay with everyone else, we can just sort of move into these construction photos, which show um, some of these performance features in progress. Um, so one of the major um, energy saving measures that we're using is radiant heat. Um, and so the entire atrium floor has, um, it's, it's a radiant floor and these smaller occupied spaces, including the labs right over here off to the side of the atrium have radiant ceilings. Um, so I just love this image of the full atrium. This is actually the same vantage point of some of the renderings that we were already looking at. Um, just showing this sort of vast area of radiant tubing before they poured the slab over it. Um, and Lane, if I could just jump in uh, Absolutely. just for the audience here. So I think people are familiar with radiant heat that has to do with like, say you're used to a cast iron radiator or a floor where the heat, heating elements are embedded in it. And the reason why that's so important for energy efficiency is that water can move 1000 times the energy in the same volume as air. And so what this building does is it uh, moves relatively low temperature water, so it doesn't it doesn't actually have to be heated very much, uh, and it's moving the same amount of energy, but one thousand times less volume. So there's one time thousand times less pumping energy. Uh, and then the other thing about this radiant floor is that it's got a lot of thermal mass, so it tends to hold the heat or hold the cool. And so uh, you'll see when you go in the building, there's there's only enough air movement in the building both natural ventilation and active ventilation uh, to change over the CO2 and keep the air fresh and healthy. Uh, and that's just an enormous saving compared to many buildings where there are very, very large ducts blowing a lot of air, serving both the purpose of heating and cooling as well as uh, fresh air makeup. All right, I'll move into the double skin. Um, so, this was from last week. There was some testing done on site um, just to make sure that um, there wasn't water penetrating through the double skin. It passed the test. Um, but these images, I think, are just helpful to show sort of the depth and the scale of the cavity. Um, and when this building is open and you have a chance to enter it, when you cross this threshold here through the first set of double doors, make sure that you pause and look up because you will be able to see up through these floor grates. Typically, of course, there won't be anyone standing on it. It's just there for maintenance purposes. Um, but it is sort of this unusual feature that you're able to look all the way up through um, in its finished condition. Um, and, you know, these diagrams are just showing like different aspects of how the how the double skin supports performance, but I'll, I'll move on to this just because these sort of so, show some, well, like I said, this is the double skin where you can, this will be the basically the finished view where you can look up through the grates and that's this airflow path that we discussed that goes up into the fan room. 
Um, and then these other two photos are showing conditions, you know, that really won't be visible when the building is completed. Um, the first one um, is up in the fan room where you can see this set of control dampers um, up at the top of the cavity. Um, and so the fans are located off here to the right, um, out of view. And then um, these, oops, sorry. These are the um, dampers uh, in the atrium wall that will be covered with the wood slats at those air transfer points. Um, and then here are those three um, smoke evacuation fans up at the top here. Um, and this is a ceiling fan. Um, and you can also see the um, radiant panels um, that are typically going to be used. They're slightly different than what's in the labs, in the um, offices and other sort of conference and collaboration spaces. Um, and again, of course, the fans are there just to assist air movement. Um, and, and, and maybe Elaine, just to tie a few of these things together. So if you are a person who's in this building, what you'll experience, say, if you're in a team room or something like that, is the building can draw air and cool air from the outside when the air temperature is the right temperature outside. It could even draw warm air in, but typically cooling. And, and then the next step before turning on any kind of active air conditioning is actually to have the fan uh, turn on because it'll actually blow air on you. And as we're all familiar with the, the wind chill factor, it actually cools you off. And then finally, active uh, cooling might occur. And so there's these whole sequences of steps that happen and the building energy management system understands this. It's actually gonna learn over time how to do this and what occupants want. And occupants can also override some of the systems. So it's actually all very integrated to stepwise start with what people call free cooling move up to some active air blown on the uh, person to help them cool off, and then finally to turn on active chilling if required. All right, and this is our last slide and our last feature. Um, I think this is Arjun's photo. I don't know if you wanna jump back in here quickly just to describe this. I believe this was taken um, before, you know, when they had this temporary floor up basically so that these skylights could be constructed. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, this kind of shows through thorough analysis, like the image in the on the bottom right shows, we we looked at the sun angle and wanted to make sure the right on, the right amount of daylight penetrates into the building, and the daylight is not only being you know is being used by the atrium space itself, but it also the spaces around the atrium are borrowing daylight. To, to have the right amount of light so that the offices and the conference rooms don't really have to switch that on. So that was a really important analysis that we did. And, um, and that's kind of the final, final product. And it seems to be, seems to be working well, as, as Stephen mentioned. Great. I think that's the last slide. Is that correct, uh, Elaine? Yeah, I'll just go ahead and stop sharing. We're really looking forward to moving in. Um, uh, it's going to be a wonderful building to be in. But we're going to move on now to some students who have been working on how do you visualize the energy energy use of the building and its, its unique characteristics. I mean, what we've told you is a sort of insider's view about how it was all put together and how it's meant to work. But the students who are about to speak now are going to talk about how do you sort of visualize all this in a way that can be meaningful to everybody who comes in the building. Hello, everyone. My name is Kira. Hi, I'm Avery. Hi, I'm Sunny. I'm Annie, and we're a team from the Thayer Design Corps working, to, working with the Irving Institute to see how to make their energy performance visible. So as an overview of our presentation, we're going to explain the prompt we got for this project, our methods and research, some interviews and insights we got, our design framework, and our steps looking forward. So we know that the new Arthur L. Irving building is an energy superstar. The building's expected to consume less than 20 MMBTU square foot, putting it in the top tier of energy performance. 
but it's possible for an occupant to enter the building or even work in it every day and never know that the building is exceptional since it will feel normal and comfortable. So our question is, how might we make the Irving Institute's energy performance visible? Our goals for this term were to identify stakeholders, conduct primary research, conduct secondary research, and synthesize all our insights. Some stakeholders we identified were employees working in the building, the sustainability office, students using the building, whether they're studying, eating, walking, socializing, taking classes, the Thayer School of Engineering, Tuck School of Business, Hanover and the greater Upper Valley area, visitors and the college itself. All right, so moving into our methods and research, how we went about going, went about that this term. Uh, first off, we toured the Irving building, which was a really awesome experience. After that, we attended at some energy sem seminars similar to this one um, and some other lectures about how sustainability on Dartmouth campus has been like. Uh, we also conducted some independent secondary research on our own. And we also conducted three formal and eight formal interviews uh, with a wide variety of people. Um, some people familiar with displaying sustainability, some people who were familiar with sustainable buildings, and finally just students and other potential users of this new Irving building. Uh, so some after we toured the building, some major takeaways we had was that this building is really a living, breathing organism with a lot of different components, such as the glass chimney, and also sustainability is really in the details, as we talked about earlier in this seminar. Um, that has a lot of those little niche features that make it really important. Um, and also connecting buildings. This is part, the Irving Institute is part of a greater network of buildings on Dartmouth campus and they all kind of work together. Um, we also talked about how water is a really key component, particularly when it comes to heating and cooling the building that really stood out to us as a takeaway. And finally, open space and light are really a priority as you've seen in pictures of that beautiful atrium. They really, space and light really matter a lot in that building. Um, so these are just some pictures. This is our team uh, touring the Irving building. And then the other picture, you can see those, those uh, pipes that are working to like pipe that hot water into and out of the building um, and heat the whole space. So we just found those really interesting takeaways. And then what we got from our energy, our energy seminars that we attended, we learned a lot about how Dartmouth's energy system really operates, which we talked about earlier, and also in general Dartmouth sustainability goals. Uh, we also learned from some other universities about how they're approaching sustainability. In particular, we talked to Georgia Tech, Princeton University, and also Smith College. And finally, we just dis discussed the future of sustainable universities and what it could look like to have all of these high level institutions moving towards a more sustainable future. Uh, and then finally, some other secondary research that we conducted, we looked a lot at art installations and how these installations going about, go about making the invisible visible, as we've been saying, and also addressing sustainability. Uh, we looked at some other sustainability, sustainable buildings, some in college campuses and some outside of those institutions. And we talked a lot about human building interactions and really how people engage with buildings on an everyday life, particularly college students. Um, and finally, what it means to display sustainability in different settings. Um, moving into our, um, our research from interviews, uh, we talked to a lot of Dartmouth students about buildings and how they interact with uh, buildings. Um, we found out that the, the main uh, thing for them is their sensory experience with the building as they enter, uh, which mostly comes from the light in the building, the temperature, the people, uh, the sounds and smell. And we also asked them what makes them want to stay in a building, and it was often the purpose of, for the purpose of studying uh, to get food or just for the vibe, which is a very interesting term to us um, as it plays into this sensory experience that a lot of the students describe. Uh, another person we interviewed was Lori Loeb. She's a professor here at uh, Dartmouth in the computer science department and also the faculty director of Dolly Lab. Um, she did a really interesting project a couple years ago where she created this digital polar bear and essentially it used real time data from the McLaughlin building here on campus. And it was able to show how energy efficient students living in the building were being so if they were being more energy efficient things like turning off lights saving those kinds of energy, then the polar bears little iceberg would get bigger. 
but if they were being less energy efficient, the iceberg would shrink and the polar bear would get sad. Um, so that was a really interesting project that she did. And some takeaways we got from that interview were really that people need feedback in order to change their ways and being able to use real-time data to get that feedback is an excellent way to do that. Um, we also talked about how displays that last a long time must be self-sustaining. You have to have someone who's going to be accountable and going to look after it or has to sustain itself in some way so that it doesn't die five years down the road. Um, and finally, you have to create something that draws people in. It has to appeal to emotions. It has to be exciting, offer a challenge or something along those lines. Next person we interviewed is Jack Wilson, who's actually in the audience here today. He's a professor at Dartmouth Institute of Art Engineering, and he was also previously an architect and planner for Dartmouth. Um, one great takeaway we had from Professor Wilson is he remembered a display that our energy school, uh, McLean, had that reported on electricity in real time. And the thing with this display, this display is that it needed to be maintained over time. Professor Wilson said that the best way to just demonstrate a building's performance is to compare what's actually happening with the building with its goals and aspirations. And that architecture is a sensory experience. It's not just what you see, but what you hear, smell, feel. And this ties into what we learned from talking about students, that the feeling of experiencing a building is really important. Finally, we had another in-depth interview with Mary Tobin. She's a Dartmouth 20 who's currently teaching English on a Fulbright grant in Germany. And she worked for CRB as a mechanical engineer after graduation. Um, Mary worked a lot on reimagining energy systems and she did her senior year design challenge um, at Dartmouth on Dart reimagining Dartmouth's uh, energy system and uh, proposed um, a more sustainable energy system for Dartmouth with the team. Um, a thing that always stood out to Mary uh, as, upon entering buildings, uh, which might have been like because she's a, she has an engineering background, is the signage and the plaques uh, that display the energy usage of buildings, um, which are often overlooked, but to her, they, were, they still were of great value to show how efficient the building was. And she explained to us how for her sustainability is twofold. First of all, you have the energy profile of a building, which is important in the construction of the building and the way you design the building's envelope. Um, but as, as you're designing a building, you have to keep in mind that the building will eventually be used by uh, people and how this user interaction um, also participates in the sustainability of the building. Um, most important in the user interaction with the building are the air quality, the light, the plants, or if there are plants at all, uh, and the materiality of the building. So for example, the material that's been used in the wall decor, like the decor, the walls, um, or um, the furniture in the building. So from all of our research, we took our insights and created a design framework that we would be able to apply next term as we go into prototyping. So we came up with three different pillars that we want our design to encompass. So we created design principles as well as education stories that we want our design to be able to tell and finding moments that matter for uh, these stories to be told. So first with our design principles, we came up with five. The first is the building is a living, breathing thing and we want to our design to portray that. Second, we need to meet people where they are able to learn, where they're willing to uh, learn something new and where they have the capacity to take a second to stop and listen. Three, we want to incorporate many ways to engage with our design. Four, we want to design for sustainability, something that will live on after we leave Dartmouth and doesn't have to have too much maintenance. And five, we want the design to seamlessly be integrated with the building. Next, we thought about education stories uh, and thought critically about which stories were important for the users of the building to know about and experience through our design. So first, we wanted a story about the glass chimney. Second, we wanted to tell a story about water heating and cooling. Third, about careful insulation. And fourth, about natural lighting. And then in thinking about moments that mattered, we wanted to really draw on our, our interviews with students and people who are 
engaging with the building to think about when are these moments that we can tell stories. So the first one that we found is waiting in line, whether that be at the cafe or waiting for classes. Um, we found that this was a moment when students or different users were taking a second um, to breathe and not engage in the, their normal busy life. The second is when using the restroom, um, we thought about you know, the, the mirror space, the stalls and different places where, where people do not normally engage with these sort of conversations and might have a second to stop and listen. Third, we thought about entering the building. Um, we understood this to be a universal experience that everyone was going to have, regardless of if you're a student who's in the building every single day or a visitor. And lastly, we thought about the seating in the atrium. And the atrium is a really special place where the lighting is very bright and open and beautiful. Um, and students will be studying and different people will be walking through. So this was all the work that we have uh, done over this term, which was basically our research term. But looking forward, um, moving on with this project in the winter, we have a couple um, points that um, we'll be looking at. So we'll start ideating um, ideas for a solution for our initial question and prototyping for this, uh, after which we will gather stakeholder feedback and um, continue to synthesize our insights. Um, that, those are our goals for the winter um, and hopefully we'll also be able to share those with you. Um, but thank you all so much for listening. <laughs>
at any part in an office, you were no more than two, 150 feet from food. Um, so again, that kind of encourages employees to kind of snack as they bump into their coworkers. Um, and obviously everyone loves food, um, especially considering that on this west side of campus, there are fewer um, food sources, especially for undergraduates. Um, but yeah, that's kind of been a lot of our research this term, um, like the other group as well. We'll keep chugging along and then hopefully we'll be able to have maybe a fun series of events to launch next um, year. Um, but yeah, in general, we're really excited to see the building open up. Well, this is super. Thank you guys so much. We're also excited to have the building open up and I'm happy to have, we have some questions coming in. Um, if you could uh, type your questions back in and if the people who are here could also turn your cameras back on and we can have a conversation in our remaining 15 minutes. So um, Jack Wilson, are the radiant ceilings for cooling? What is the air conditioning strategy and how does that interface with natural ventilation? And my other question um, as we go through this, and I remember talking to the architects at the very beginning on this one, was are we accounting for more rapid uh, climate change? And everybody assured me that we were, but if you guys could just speak to that point when, when answering Jack's question, that would be great. Thanks, Elaine and Arjun. Um, yes, so the, I, I'll take a stab at it and then anyone else can chime in afterwards. So yes, the radiant, both the radiant um, floor and the radiant ceilings are used for both heating and cooling. Um, and the intention is that we should not, the building should need to use that mechanical cooling. So that, Elizabeth, I think is part of the future proofing. The idea is that even if, you know, on opening day, there's no need for cooling, potentially in 10 years there would be. And so it's important to have the system in place. Um, um, and then beyond that, I mean, there is also demand control ventilation, um, which I, you know, is another aspect of providing um, thermal comfort in the summer. And this actually goes to our next question. And I think the future proofing um, Morgan Peach, who's a colleague of mine in environmental studies, how did you design for variability in occupant behavior, such as opening and closing windows, which could either support or undermine your energy use objectives? Um, could creatively revealing the functionality of this building to occupants in some way inform real-time energy conserving behavior? Yes, that is a great question. <laughs> um, uh, and I hope that both Arjun and Stephen will jump in on this response. Um, the, there were many conversations during design about finding that balance between automation um, and user controllability because we know that to really have performance optimized, you want everything automated. Um, but of course, you do want that flexibility. So most, you know, the windows are all automated. Um, the shades are all automated. But in every space where those elements exist, there are also user override. Um, uh, and I don't know, Stephen, if there's anything or Arjun that you want to add to that. I think that that's always, uh, when you do systems like this, I think that's always a very important question. And you can go to one extreme where I think, uh, Stephen, if you remember, and Elizabeth, we talked about, can you control things with an app on your phone? Like, you know, that's one extreme. Or to re you can check on your app on your phone, oh, did I forget to close the office window? So you can check and close it versus the other end where everything is automated. So um, you always have to kind of you know calibrate it it well so that it works for for everyone. The other challenging piece I was because we uh, the 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 groups in this building that work together are going to grow. Somebody's going to come in, you know maybe it's a team of two. They grow up. They, the, the the group goes or grows over the next three years and becomes like a ten person group. So the program spaces had to be designed in a way that they can accommodate that growth, and which meant that the the occupancy and the building systems also had to also had to respond to that. So that was the challenging part, but I think we were able to to achieve that um, um, in the design. Yeah, I would just add two more things. One. In a way, this building is really super modern and it's it's state of the art, but it's also returning to a time where people interact with buildings. I mean, it used to be in the old days, not that long ago, if it was hot in your house and it was cool outside, you opened the window. And when it cooled off, you closed the window. And 
And so this building is gonna ask the, the occupants to interact with it and to learn. The other thing is, as Arjun was just saying, is that as the space gets more utilized, we're gonna find that the occupants have more impact on its energy use than the base of the building itself. And the plug loads, what are called plug loads, your computers, things you plug into the wall, are actually gonna be a significant load. And so one of the things I would uh, suggest to the student projects is think about how we can measure and monitor that. Another thing that we've learned is well into the project that the cafe itself is actually gonna be a very high energy density area. And how do we actually uh, teach people about that? So I would, I would say this is gonna be a great opportunity for people to get back into the mode of saying, I need to think a little bit, I need to learn from the building uh, because we can actually all work together much more efficiently and cheaply that way uh, and much more in a symbiosis. So I think it's gonna be exciting learning and education for all of us. I also wanna call out, we're calling it the Irving Institute building, but we're not here alone. And this is really a building that is a, a hub of the energy conversations and activities on campus. And the students did a good job pointing it out, but the sustainability office is on the first floor. There's a cafe on the first floor. The Revers Center for Energy at Tuck led by April Salas is on the second floor with the Irving staff. Um, we have colleagues from arts and sciences, professors from Thayer, who are also part of this building. The whole purpose of this building is to be flexible over time. All the offices are the same size. And when somebody has seasonal allergies, they can keep those windows shut to manage for their own health needs too. And so I really appreciated working with the architects as they helped us think about, you know, how do we have spaces that are adaptable? How do we have spaces that can transform to having um, offices for postdocs or offices for single occupancy and having also some of the best view spaces be open for the public? Um, and I, I really appreciate it. I remember uh, Roger, who's not here today, Roger Goldstein, one of the architects, you know, talking about old New England factories that would have this way that they would let light in without in passive lighting. And that's kind of what our skylight is modeled after. So for me, it was just really interesting to think about what we can learn from the past in terms of how we activate the buildings. Um, a question from Tad Montgomery. Has there been any specific design to allow for other life in the building, plants, et cetera? It's hard for me to envision sustainability without a visceral connection to the natural world. Lane, you want to talk about your favorite green wall? <laughs> um, yes, I'll talk about it for, for just a quick moment. Um, I love indoor plants and I, you know, certainly the building throughout the design, we were thinking a lot about biophilia. And so in addition to, to this green wall that we have in the atrium, um, we were also selecting our material palette with that in mind. I think it's, it is important to note though, when you're thinking about indoor plants, they are for the health of the occupants. They're not inherently you know, sustainable in the sense of saving energy or really even serving the natural environment, right? You're not, it's not as if you're creating a full ecosystem inside the building. So while there is this wellness benefit that I think we all enjoy, it is distinct from other kinds of um, performance oriented design. Um, but we do have in the atrium against Murdo actually, um, between the, and we didn't talk about this actually, but there's a very large a extended ramp that goes down adjacent to the existing wall of Murdeau. And it's, it's an adjacent- accessible building. I mean, we worked with you to make sure that we had accessibility throughout that building and, and it really connects campus nicely that way. You guys did a great job with that. Absolutely. It was, it was really exciting that that was such a high priority for the occupants to create that connection. Yes. Um, and I think that was part of the reason that we wanted to have the green wall next to it, just to enhance the experience of using that ramp. Well, and, and for me, it was an experience that was by practice. I was going to one of the meetings with you and I was walking through one of the Thayer buildings and this older visitor to Dartmouth came against some stairs and they had to backtrack and find an elevator to go up. And I, it just made me really understand how having an accessible space was so important for all of the future occupants. Um, I want, there's one more question from Scott Fisher. That's actually quite a long question. I'm gonna let the students read that because it's some advice to you about how the building is there. But as we're talking, um, I have appreciated in the conversations, not only with this group, but with the other universities, 
how these buildings are not only the faculty and the students and, and the staff who are there, but also visitors. And so as the students in the design groups are thinking about this, how do we also show this for the people who are coming here? We were just invited to host and show it off to a, an Ivy League provost meeting. I mean, how can we make this a showpiece for having this conversation on campus as well and for inviting in this conversation of what does it mean to do this and how do we think about this there? And also in the question, I just want to also call out James Pike, who says, great work all. It will be an impressive building. And I'd just like to say that's because of James. And James is somebody who from the very beginning has been central to making this project happen. He's been overseeing all of the construction. And since he was put on this project, his presence has made us all better, more steady and, and able to keep on track. So James, it will be an impressive building and that's in large part thanks to you. So I just wanted to make sure that we called James and his hard, hard work out on this space. I know he's happy to see the building off, but we're always happy to have him in the building as long as he wants to stay. So, um, and we have a four time lapse from our site um, and let's play that now, Stephanie, as we, we bring some more questions in. Um, <clears throat> So we can see what we're building here. If you guys want to comment along as what's going on, please feel free to do that. Oh, there. The, the, I haven't seen this. So we first the demolition of parts of Mardo, then the foundations for you know the glass volume in the front. Then we're taking over the plaza uh, slowly and slowly. And then the foundations go in, the structural steel starts to go up and infill that. That's amazing. This is very cool. Yeah, yeah this is the first time you've seen this too. It really is wonderful. Yeah, it's very cool. And, and then you, you have the overall form of the building. Yeah. I mean, I remember two years ago going to a meeting and saying, we have a hall. <laughs> <laughs> and now look at this. Look at this. This is really yeah. wonderful. And then the exterior wall starts to go happen. The roof is closing off, closing off the exterior. Uh, the AVB insulation is going to follow soon. Close off the the horizontals or the slope surfaces so that no water gets in. The windows get in. That's amazing. Insulation and the brick follows soon after. That's fantastic. Architects love this. This is like, uh, <laughs> these are amazing. Well, what I really appreciate from this video is just this time lapse of from the whole to where we are today. Thank you very yeah. much for, for staff for putting that together. Um, the, the, the question Scott had for the students, and maybe you could speak to this, was, you know, instead of thinking about just energy and cost, thinking about the how of achieving this and not just showing visitors, but also thinking about carbon dioxide emissions and savings. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm also really cognizant that alumni connections and others are, are part of this space too, as people kind of come and go into the building. There's one more technical question, and then I wanted to let you guys close with some big thoughts, but Morgan Peach, um, how did the design team navigate trade-offs between glazing, particularly skylights, daylighting, solar gain, and possible overheating or heat loss, and thermal mass within the envelope? Above all, beautiful design and ambitious design program. And I'm hoping that our actual educational and academic program will be as ambitious and beautiful. But if you could speak to those trade-offs and how we, you navigated them, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, it, it, it's always a very uh, collaborative process. Uh, I like a lot of glass in my buildings. Uh, Elaine, on the other hand, takes away all the glass that I put. So uh, she's the one who uh, does works uh, with all our consultants and does thorough analysis. Um, so we did, for, for example, on the south facade and the skylight, there was thorough glass analysis done on the proportions of how much glass should be there on an elevation which is facing a certain direction. And for and so we do that analysis and then work. Uh, and calibrate that elevation accordingly. But sometimes you do need glass, like for example, the glass volume that's there in the front for, for having you know, beautiful views outside the building, which are also very important. 
so then we we then start to play with you know, the types of glazing and then double skin as you saw right there. So there are other tricks that you can do, um, but when you do those tricks, of course, it gets a lot more expensive. So again, it's a it's a calibration and a lot of analysis. No, I, I appreciate and, it. And I just want to say we have about three more minutes and I want to let the two student teams, the architects and also you, Stephen, you know, from this project, what have you learned and what do you want to take forward for the students for your further analysis, for Arjun and Elaine for, for future programs or building design? And Stephen, you have so much energy experience, you can say anything and we'll think it's brilliant. But let's start with um, Avery's team on the students, the first student group that went, Sunny and Avery and um, Annie. If you guys could unmute and just give some idea of just where you guys see going in this next term that you're working on this project. Yeah, I think this this having this opportunity has been really exciting and it's been awesome to hear all these new perspectives um, about the building that we spent a lot of time working on and yet I feel like we always learn so much each time we talk to a new person. So I'm definitely very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you all about it and I think Looking forward, we're super excited to start actually having more tangible ideas come come about from all this research that we've been doing. And I think my team has learned so much during this entire process. So we're just excited to to get to prototyping and ideating. Fantastic. And I heard the second student team had to drop off. Um, there was a question in the Q&A about sharing the um, slides, if that's possible. But Arjun and Elaine, if you could just talk about what you've learned from this project and where you'll think about projects differently in the future. Um, well, I, I, I'll go first. Uh, I, I mean, we were lucky enough to have an Elizabeth, a Stephen, and a James Spike on a project. You know, and not every project is like that, believe me. So when you have that opportunity, I think collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I think that's that's a wonderful lesson here. So. Yeah, and I, I guess I have a sort of similar lesson, which is that, you know, if, if I look back on this project, like what made it so successful in my mind, it's that there, there was so much clarity around the goals um, that the whole team embraced and you know, usually we have sustainability goals on projects, but, you know, sometimes some consultants are more focused on other things and, you know, some group like the users may be more focused on other things, but there was great unity across the whole team on what the priorities for this building was going to be. And as a result, you know, every person, person shared their expertise to help further those same goals. Um, and so that's what I would like to try and replicate on future projects, whether or not the exact goal is the same. Thank you. And Stephen, last word to you. Um, just a couple of points. One, we didn't talk about cost a lot, but we did spend some more money on making the building efficient. But typically in commercial buildings, it's less than 5% additional cost for the energy systems or the energy enhancement. And we're going to use one third the energy. So over the lifetime of the building, it will actually save the college quite a bit of money and a, and a lot on its carbon footprint. The second thing is because it's so efficient, it sets itself up for different types of energy supply in the future. And so as the college transitions away from number six fuel oil, perhaps moves over to heat pumps and other ways of, of uh, heating and cooling buildings, this building will be ready and poised to do that. And those types of systems can often be powered directly with renewable energy like wind and sun. And so I think the building is a great example of what can be done right now, but it's also planning for the future. And, you know, I think 100 years from now, people will look at it and say, not only was it great when it got started, but people really were thinking generations ahead about what it could do over time. Well, and I want to thank Arjun and Elaine for all your hard work, James Pike for seeing this project too, Stephen for all of your engagement, and now the students for animating the building. Our goal is to make energy and society a fundamental heart of Dartmouth, and I think we're off to a good start. We have a home, and now it's our job, guys, to build the programming and the activities and the research and the education to really make this happen, because we know the problem's important. We know that students are passionate about this topic, and we look forward to joining you again next term. 
um, to talk about how we do that. So this is the final uh, DEC lunch, Dartmouth Energy Collaborative lunch of this term. And I wish you all a happy holiday season and we look forward to seeing you in the next year. Happy New Year, happy holidays. So we'll kick off on January 19th. We're also going to be hosting another Energy 101 for anyone who's interested as well. It will also be virtual and in person. Thanks everybody and have a, a, a nice, a nice break. Good luck students on your exams. Bye-bye.